Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. So today, I thought we'd do something a little bit different. Instead of talking about business or personal development, I thought we'd brighten up the mood and talk about nuclear war. So in the past year, uh, you know, we've seen the U.S. and NATO move massive amounts of military equipment towards the border of Russia. And in response, we've seen the Russian Navy deploy their fleets around the world. And when you consider that the U.S. and Russia have around 12,000 nuclear weapons pointed at each other, uh, I thought it might be a, a subject worth discussion. What would it be like? Could you survive? Where should you go? And what's the truth when it comes to radiation fallout and an electromagnetic pulse? Well, to help bring us up to speed on how to survive the apocalypse, we are joined by one of the most prominent survivalists in the world, Mr. James Wesley Rawls. For nine years, James served as a military intelligence officer for the Army with a rank of captain, and today he is the founder and editor of the largest website in the world on the topic of preparedness, survivalblog.com. So, if you are one of the lucky ones who manages to avoid instant vaporization, here is what you need to know to survive and thrive as the next Mad Max. Welcome back, everybody. Mike Dillard here. And today, we are joined by none other than James Wesley Rawls. So, James, welcome to Self Made Man. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thanks for having me on, Mike. So, I'm pretty excited about the show because this is very different from a topic standpoint than uh, what we usually talk about here with our our group of entrepreneurs. But I think it is important nonetheless. This is something that I have been interested in and fascinated uh, about for years, and that is specifically the topic of, uh, you know, war these days and uh, even more specifically nuclear war. And the reason that I reached out to you to discuss this is, you know, over the past Six months to a year specifically, I hate to date you know a, a show like this, but I don't see any other way around it. You've started to see a lot of talk and a lot of rumbling and a lot of troop movements, uh, specifically over in Europe with NATO, uh, you know, Germany and other countries saying, hey, we're going to do an exercise and we're going to move 10,000 troops and tanks over here and then over here. And after witnessing the United States get ready and prep for two wars, uh, it's starting to sound very familiar. And so I thought uh, it would be awesome to have you on the show to give people, you know, some kind of basic education when it comes to what happens in a nuclear war. Is it possible to survive it and, and all of the other stuff? So thanks again for being here. Sure. Well, thank you. And, and I think it is an important topic and it's one that people should not just dismiss. You know, we've been under the, the storm clouds of nuclear war since the late 1950s. And it's, I think, at even greater risk now than it ever has been, even even at the height of the Cold War. I'd say we're probably in a juncture right now that's similar to the Berlin Missile Crisis, or, or the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Wall Crisis, in that we have manifold threats because, in part, new treaty obligations that the U.S. has created in the Balkans and with the Baltic states and the uh, the threat of the civil war in Syria turning into a regional war and then possibly a world war, we are at a very critical juncture. And it's very important that the heads of American families stand up and take the responsibility to prepare their families for the prospect of nuclear war. I know it sounds ominous and it sounds like a huge almost insurmountable task but it really isn't and i recommend that people get key resources together plan ahead and think about what exactly the steps they'll need to take to prepare their families and set a timeline and a budget and at the very minimum people should get set up with a dosimeter a rate meter and some potassium iodide or potassium iodate. Yeah, let's get uh, we'll get into the details of of all of that here in just a bit. Uh, but before we do, I would love your insight on why in the world the United States and, and NATO is picking on Russia at this juncture in time. You know, if you look on a map and you look at the military presence, the entire country is surrounded basically by NATO. Uh, I 
for one, don't perceive any threat from Russia. I, I perceive them as being like, hey, leave us alone and stop picking on us. Why specifically with, you know, Hillary no longer in the picture, but before so, lots of things were moving very quickly. And I just don't understand what, what the reason is. Well, I think that a lot of it may be defused once Trump is in office. But right now, especially with uh, the Obama administration's commitment to creating a no-fly zone over northern Syria, the, the risk is huge. But just to back up historically a bit, all of this dates back to the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of, even before that, the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, and the changing political landscape of Eastern Europe. In particular, the real provocation was not done just by the United States, but by NATO as a whole, when we offered NATO membership to former East European Soviet bloc members. And once we did that, it really opened Pandora's box because it it was pushing progressively pushing Russia into a corner by putting hostile states on the periphery of Russia inside of the former Soviet Union and the, and the uh, client states of the Warsaw Pact. So we've really, through NATO, pushed them into a very precarious position that's made them feel defensive and, and downright paranoid, and I really can't say that I blame them, when we're doing things like deploying anti-missile missile systems ABM type systems in Eastern Europe. That's a highly provocative act. And some of the treaty relationships that we forged with these former Soviet clients, and if you look particularly in the Balkan nations, the Baltic nations, and the Ukraine, you can see where we've kind of been pushing Russia more than we should have. And it's it's really gotten them quite concerned, I think justifi justifiably so, and it's to the point now where it's, it's really raised the risk of either a ground war in Eastern Europe and or brinksmanship to the point of nuclear war there. And the situation in Syria is even you know, more inflammatory in that we are at risk of physically coming into confrontation with Russia by instituting a no-fly zone. If we start shooting down Russian planes, there will be retaliation, no doubt. They won't take very kindly to seeing their pilots shot down and multi-million dollar aircraft shot down. So we're in a very precarious situation. So people should not underrate this risk. They really need to move up nuclear war preparedness measures up their list of priorities for their family preparedness planning. And how did you how did you get into into this topic and become so passionate about it? And, you know, you've got survivalblog.com, which is uh, the most trafficked, you know, website in the world when it comes to, to this topic. But how did you take an interest in this? Well, it dates all the way back to my childhood. Uh, my father was a supervisor in nuclear physics at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, where they design nuclear weapons. That's in the East Bay region of California. And Lawrence Labs, it used to be called Lawrence Radiation Laboratory when I was a kid, is where they design nuclear weapons. The, the actual manufacture is done at a facility called Panex in Texas, and a lot of the testing is done in Nevada. And a lot of the other components are created. A lot of the other um, test type components are created at Sandia Laboratories, both Sandia Livermore and Sandia in New Mexico. But Livermore was kind of ground zero for the nuclear weapons world. And growing up in that culture where most of my schoolmates were the children of nuclear physicists at the lab, uh, it really instilled in me a, a great and justifiable fear of nuclear war. And even to this day, Livermore, California has the, the highest number per capita of fallout shelters of just about any city in North America. 
because so many physicists lived there and they installed uh, home fallout shelters, recognizing the threat. So I grew up in that culture. And then I went off to college to study journalism at San Jose State University. And while I was there, I was enrolled in ROTC. And even before I got out of college, I was involved as a ROTC cadet with a military intelligence unit in Mountain View, California. That was a military intelligence reserve unit. And I spent the next six years as a drilling reserve intelligence officer. I went off and spent six months at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, studying intelligence, gathering and analysis, and uh, picked up uh, additional skill identifiers. I had a top secret security clearance. And along with that clearance came access to special access programs, the same kind of things that they're uh, they have all the controversy over with Hillary Clinton's emails right now. And I really can't go into the details of what I read because they were classified. But a lot of what I read was very alarming. And some of what I was involved in was either unclassified or very lightly classified. And that involved country studies, assessing the risk of conflict and the the demographics and the ability of various countries to withstand either an economic collapse or a, a, a major conflict. So all those country studies and my other readings really led me to believe that some of the greatest vulnerability was right here in the United States. And out of that, I ended up writing uh, my first novel series, which was the Patriot series, which uh, dealt with economic collapse. And I'm now writing a new novel series called the Counter Caliphate Chronicle series. It's kind of a forward looking view uh, of the world 30 years in the future after the advent of a global Islamic caliphate. So I've always looked at kind of the big picture, the, the manifold threats, and I've tried to apply those in practical ways to family preparedness. And that's what Survival Blog was all about. Survival Blog was started 11 years ago. It now has tens of thousands of articles, letters, and column items that have been posted. It's all fully searchable. I recommend that your readers take full advantage of that resource. It's all free of charge. There is no super secret members only area. Very good. So, you know, I, again, I chose the topic of nuclear war because, you know, frankly, if, if you just focus on the worst case scenario, then the other, the other boxes are checked by default for the most part. So, and there's a lot of really uh, misunderstanding and misinformation about what that looks like. So, you know, if God forbid something like that were to happen, what is uh, a likely scenario? You know, if you're in a, in a city where a blast goes off and you're vaporized, okay, game over, there's nothing for you to worry about here. But if you're not in that particular circumstance and you're in the, uh, you know, the outer areas and you're still alive, well, what are you dealing with at that point? Well, at that point, it all comes down to distance and mass. You really need to be far enough away from a, from a air burst or a ground burst that you're outside of the immediate blast radius. And right in the immediate zone, everything would just be vaporized. Going out from there, there'd be huge fires caused by the thermal effects of the blast and buildings being knocked down. Farther out from that, and this all depends on the, the, the size of the warhead. So it, it, it could be, we're talking a scale of either a few, just a couple of miles for the, for the immediate blast radius. To, to, if you get up into the megaton range weapons, uh, maybe 10 miles across or 15 miles across for the, for the immediate blast effects. So you, when you're looking at these, you have to think in terms of, of the potential threat and whether small tactical, tactical nuclear warheads would be used versus the, you know, the, the huge, you know, city buster megaton hydrogen bombs would be used. And as you look at these, these threats, you have to recognize that if you're outside of the immediate blast effects and thermal effects, the main things that will then affect you are going to be two things, EMP and fallout. And the EMP effects will be immediate. Uh, they'll mainly be, a, if you're outside of the, the line of sight of a nuclear 
weapon going off, then the main effects are going to come to you by way of phone lines, power lines, and internet connections. That EMP effect could be quite devastating to all the electronics in your home. And unless you have spare equipment that's Faraday shielded, you could be in the dark in terms of what's going on. The fallout effects only occur when you have a nuclear ground burst, which is where the bubble, as it were, of a nuclear bomb going off actually touches the ground and then kicks up dirt, concrete, rubble. The mushroom cloud, if you will. Off the ground and then ionizes that. It's, it's going to make all of that material that's in anywhere from microscopic dust size to large dust size to snowflake size, highly radioactive. And wherever the wind takes that, it's going to settle on the ground as what's called fallout. And then that radioactive dust is going to be emitting gamma rays, which is a, a hard form of radiation. You've got to understand that there's several different types of radiation. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. And gamma is the one you really have to worry about. Alpha rays only go a very short distance, just a, you know, a few inches perhaps. Beta rays will be stopped by something as thin as a sheet of paper or a sheet of Tyvek. But gamma rays are basically highly energetic. They're like x-rays, and they will go zooming right through hard materials. And it takes a great thickness of those hard materials to create what's called a halving distance, which is a halving thickness. A thickness of a particular material through which the amount of gamma rays that is transmitted is reduced by 50%. That's what's called a halving thickness. For water, it's around 18 inches. For lead, it's only like a, uh, a quarter inch of lead. For brick, it's like a foot of brick is a halving thickness. And these are, these are roughly off the top of my head. You can get all the detailed information you need on halving, halving thicknesses from a book called Nuclear War Survival Skills. And that is the most important book that every family needs to get. And I recommend that you get a hard copy of that book. A ebook is not going to help you if EMP has wiped out your computer. So again, the book is called Nuclear War Survival Skills. It was published originally by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And the editor was a man named Crescent Kearney, K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. His first name is Cresson, C-R-E-S-S-O-N, Cresson Kearney. And again, the book is called Nuclear War Survival Skills. Try to find the, the most recent edition you can. And used copies are available on Amazon, on eBay, even Craigslist. Just look around and you can find it. That's the most important book to find. If you're serious about protecting your family from fallout, that's the book you need. And in terms of the – go ahead. I was going to ask you, you know – what would you know? What do you do? Let's just say you're up on uh, the East Coast, right? And a, and a bomb goes off in New York, and you're maybe a hundred miles away. So you're out of the blast zone, but you're definitely in the path of fallout. What are your practical options at that point? Yeah, if you're a hundred miles out of New York, New York City, then your odds are your the the risk is actually fallout from nuclear targets in the upper Midwest. And you will have quite a bit of time before the winds carry the fallout dust to your location. So you've got a window of opportunity in the nuclear world. world they refer to that window of opportunity as the King's X. During that King's X time period, you have time to... to get your family into a prepared shelter or perhaps even create a hasty shelter for your family, get the supplies that you need there, like water and food, lots of extra batteries for your flashlights, sleeping bags and all that equipment, and of course your dosimeter and your rate meter and your potassium iodide into that shelter and button up during that period of time before the fallout st starts to settle. 
once you're in your shelter, if you have a sufficient number of having thicknesses, it will reduce the, the number of gamma rays that actually get through your shelter walls or ceiling and penetrate your body. And then at that point, it's just a numbers game in terms of can your body regenerate cells quickly enough to make up for the amount of hard gamma that's zipping through your body. It's, it's like getting multiple x-ray doses, you know, all at once. Constantly, just and standing in front of an x-ray machine. <laughs> the intensity of uh, how much fallout lands where you are and how long you can stay buttoned up in your shelter and how many having thicknesses of shelter material you have between you and the fallout. You also should have proper air filtration, which is a whole other issue, so that you're not sucking air into your shelter that has fallout dust in it. Otherwise, you're inviting radiation into your shelter if you bring that dust in. You really need to have what's called a HEPA filter, which is a high-efficiency particulate air filter, HEPA, that's bringing air into your shelter. And then you need to have a flapper valve for the outlet coming out of your shelter so you don't have a backfeed of dust coming back in through your outlet valve on your shelter. So it's a little complicated. It does require some equipment, does require some planning, but nuclear war is quite survivable. And I mean, there wouldn't be people living in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, Japan in the year 1950 if, if nuclear war was not survivable. There were lots and lots of people who survived, partly through dumb luck, but partly because they simply weren't in the blast radius and the, the total dose that they received was not enough to kill them. It made them ill, quite ill. A lot of people lost hair and so forth, but they survived. And a lot of those people lived to a ripe old age. So please don't think that nuclear war cannot be survived. Now, can you go through, you know, again, just kind of a basic estimate on how much time needs to go by before it is safe to to leave? Because I don't think a lot of people really have an understanding of what the half-life is for... Now, know. a lot of the figures I'm going to be giving you are kind of off the top of my head, but you've got to assume that if you're going to receive... Part of the confusion on all this is they've actually changed their terminology. What used to be referred to as one Rankin or one Rad is now referred to as... I think it's 100 gray is the new unit of measurement. And you, you have all the way from milligray to centigray do doses. But what used to be co uh, called 500 rad or Rankin was a dose that would kill about 70% of the people who received that dose. So if you have enough having thicknesses of shelter material bet between you and the fallout, that means in, in, if you were just standing outside, you get a 500 rad dose from the typical fallout. Um, and again, it varies widely based on the, the size of the device and where you happen to be and how much fallout dust arrives where you are. If you have one having thickness between you and the fallout, that means you'll only get a, a 250 Rankin dose. And if you have two having thicknesses, you'd only get 125 Rankin dose. 125 Rankins is just going to give people an upset stomach and diarrhea for a, a week or two. It's quite survivable. But if you don't have those having thicknesses, odds are you're going to die if you're in an area that has a lot of radio, radiation, a lot of radioactive fallout present. The emergence time, which is the calculation of how long you need to stay in your shelter, is fairly complicated. Again, that's described in detail. There are, are what's called emergence tables that are available both online and in publications like Nuclear War Survival Skills that show you how long you should stay in your shelter before you can safely emerge. And even after you emerge, for a period of several months, you should probably be spending more than half of each day in your shelter so that your total dose is lower. You can go out and be engaged in activities that you need to, you know, to operate a farm or to do gardening or whatever, but you still should be spending your nights, you should be sleeping in your shelter for weeks or months even after your official emergence date just to keep your, 
your radiation dose lower. You're still going to get some radiation, but if you come out after your emergence day and then continue to sleep in your shelter for weeks or months later, the frank effects of radiation will be almost unnoticeable. Yeah, that's what I thought was really interesting to, to learn that the, the half-life, if you will, or, or the decay time of the gamma radiation from a nuclear blast is completely different from what you would uh, get from, let's say, a nuclear power plant like Fukushima and, and what's coming right. out of that. There you're going to be getting the act. If, if a nuclear pl plant were to melt down or blow up, you would be getting the actual uranium or plutonium isotopes or either the, the material themselves or isotopes thereof, which are highly radioactive and highly persistent. And, you know, for plutonium, we're talking 10,000 years, okay? It right. does not go. But if it's simply dust that has been ionized and irradiated by a nuclear blast, that radioactive dust is going to have a very fast delay uh, decay period. And some of the isotopes that they that this dust carries have half lights that only measured in minutes, some that are measured in days, some that are measured in weeks, like, you know, strontium 90, for example, has a half life in the, in the matter of weeks. If you come out of your shelter at a safe emergence day, the dust that's remaining on the ground is not going to be particularly radioactive. At that point, if you're just wearing a dust mask and you hose down the sidewalks around your house, for example, it would then be safe to walk around. And then at that point, all you're going to need is to wear plastic bags on your shoes and take those off before you come back into your house and do that for a period of weeks or months until the, the radioactive emission from any residual radioactive dust around your house has, has decayed and degraded. Now, there's some other effects that people need to be aware of, like the concentration of some of those isotopes in the food chain, most notably uh, dairy products, because what will happen is as the radioactive dust settles on fields and cows are out grazing on those fields, they will be concentrating through their own biological processes, they're going to be concentrating those isotopes and into their milk of, of dairy cows, for example, or dairy goats. And then if you were to drink that milk, you'd be getting a, a big dose of strontium 90 or whatever. So it's important that you need to stay away from all dairy products and also fish, for example, because fish tend to concentrate radiation as well for a period of weeks or months. And at that point, if there's still a functioning system, there'll be nuclear experts that'll tell you at what period it would then become safe to then ingest fish or to ingest dairy products. I need to also bring up one other bit about biological concentration, and that is the human thyroid gland. Oh, great. That's exactly what I was going to ask you next. We have our own biological concentration in the thyroid gland, which is it naturally concentrates isotopes. And you often hear talk about using potassium iodide or potassium iodate as they use, they, they refer that to that and kind of fallaciously as uh, anti radiation pills. Well, they really, they're not, they're not stopping the radiation from accumulating. The way that potassium iodide or potassium iodate work is they serve to flush a, a dose of those of those medications will flush your thyroid gland of those isotopes so they're not held there in your throat in your thyroid glands in your neck so that they don't create frank health effects now there's been some recent studies done that show that the positive benefits of potassium iodate or potassium iodide are, are really best only for someone who's under the age of 45. Once you're over the age of 45, the risks of taking potassium iodate or potassium iodide actually outweigh the benefits. So that stockpile should really be reserved for younger people in any uh, family or retreat group. 
Interesting. I had uh, I had not heard that before. So, you know, next uh, next big scenario here that people would need to be concerned about because you know at this point you're like you know what fallout is is manageable, but there's something that I think is even more dangerous uh, in a situation like this, which is the effects of the electromagnetic pulse and and what that has on electronics. And then what that means from a societal standpoint, you know, if your fridge stops working, your AC stops working, the gas station stops pumping gas. Right. That could be a huge effect because if EMP takes down the power grids, we're going to have a situation where commerce stops. There'll be huge shortages of just about everything imaginable. There'll be enormous numbers of refugees that hit the road, and those refugees could be a, a risk to you and your family. Also, if the power grids are dropped for an extended period of time, it's possible that nuclear power plants will lose the cooling capacity of their spent fuel ponds. And those spent fuel ponds just have a light cover over the top of them, as we saw at Fukushima, for example. And if the power is cut off, the circulating pumps for those spent fuel ponds no longer work, they're going to reach a boiling point. All the water will boil off of those ponds, leaving the spent fuel rods exposed to the air. And then you could have a meltdown or possibly a steam explosion of those spent fuel rods. And then you would have horrible fallout for anyone who's downwind of those. Uh, that would be uh, a, light, a lot like Fukushima, but on a grand scale where you could see dozens of power plants all melting down at the same time. And that so, would basically be the end of life on the planet. <laughs> so. uh, well, it, it could be really bad for anyone downwind. Now, say you're on the West Coast where they no longer have any nuclear power plants that are operating. Uh, most of those are in maintenance mode, and most of them have had uh, their well, I say some of them have had their spent fuel rods removed. But anyone living on the West Coast is actually going to get more nuclear fallout from nuclear power plants in the eastern United States melting down and nuclear power plants in uh, Europe and in the in Russia and in China with those power plants melting down. They'll actually get more fallout from there than they will from anything that uh, they're in close proximity to. It actually would be fallout circling the earth would be the greatest risk to someone in the western United States. Now, for someone in the Ohio River Valley or on the East Coast, beware, because you're going to be downwind of not just the missile fields and all those nuclear targets, but you're also going to be downwind of America's nuclear power plants. And th those effects could be huge. And uh, you, there, the, the, life, the loss of life could actually be greater from, if it's a limited nuclear war, greater from the EMP effects dropping the power grids and then causing uh, the spent fuel ponds to have steam explosions and release of nuclear, really bad nuclear fallout. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, for those of you who are out there living in, in metropolitan areas like myself, if you're in a high rise, lots and lots of things to think about that most people don't. For example, if you lose power in the city, you've got basically two flushes, you know, in your toilet before that's no longer working. You don't have water coming out of your tap anymore, basically, because, uh, you know, the, the pumps are not no longer functioning. So for me, I live, you know, on, on the 26th floor of a high rise. That means uh, I have nowhere to use the restroom anymore and I have no water, which after 24 hours, 36 hours, that becomes a, a really, really, really big issue. And now I've mm -hmm. got to walk up and down 50 flights of stairs every single time I need to leave my home. <laughs> which... <laughs> yeah. From a fallout perspective, being on the middle floor of a high rise building is actually one of the safest places to be because you have the having thickness of all those floors above you and below you. So say the fallout ends up down on the ground and the gamma rays are being emitted, you have the having thicknesses of all those floors of material from the ground up. And then for any fallout that lands on the roof of the building, all the having thicknesses of the floors above you are to your advantage. So actually on the middle one of the middle group of floors of a high rise building is actually one of the safest places to be from the perspective of fallout. That is, you're outside of the blast radius, 
and your windows don't all blow out. And uh, then, then you'd end up with fallout right in your living room. That and with the understanding or fact that you have also you know, brought up some supplies to your home. <laughs> you know, again, right. if you've got to stay in one place yeah. for 30 days, yeah. water. Also, yeah. I wouldn't want to be in an urban environment simply because you're going to have millions of people who are just playing in panic mode and they're going to be at each other's throats for something as simple as bottles of water and flashlight batteries. They'll be killing each other over those things. Absolutely. And I, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm grateful that I live in Texas. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, <laughs> there's no shortage of firearms or, or bullets here. You know, so that to me is what I would suggest people think about the most. Uh, I, I really think the most dangerous part about this entire scenario is actually the people around you. Yes, absolutely. In fact, people should very seriously consider strategically relocating to a lightly populated area and preferably one that is an energy exporting region. And I talk about a lot of those in my blog and in my novels. And two in particular that I like are the Four Corners region and also the inland portion of the Northwest. That's where I live. And if someone were to move to the inland Northwest, where I'm, where I'm speaking to you from right now is an area where we produce megawatts of power from hydroelectric dams year round. And we export that power to the coast and all through uh, to, the, to the greater uh, region to, to feed the Western power grid. If you're in an area like that, if the power grid goes down, it'll be the areas that are power exporters that see localized power grids reestablished the most quickly. And in fact, in places like the Four Corners, I, I sat down and talked with the management of one of the power utilities there, and they said that they had a scheme already in place and the infrastructure in place to do what's called islanding their power, where they become an island of, of light in the midst of a, a great big blackout, where they re will immediately, and I'm talking not just in days, but in moments after the, the Western power grid collapses, they can reconfigure, and they already have the procedures in place to do this, to recreate a local island of power where they will have power, whereas the rest of the Western United States does not. So that's the type of area where you want to live, not only for the sake of population density, so you won't have your neighbors at your throat, but also if you're in a power exporting region, you'll be in an area where the power grid comes back up and the chances of your survival will be tremendously higher because there won't be the huge societal effects that will be will be seen elsewhere. At, at that point, the real risk will be Refugees coming in from long distances, driving into a region and overwhelming the local population. That's a whole other scenario. So what would, you, what would you recommend to those who are listening on some just the bare necessities of what you would recommend that they, they have on hand? Well, as with any other scenario, not just nuclear war, but the most important things are water and food. Every family should have at least two water filters. They should have a compact filter something like a Katahdin combi filter. And they should also have a large gravity filter, like a Big Berkey or a Big Berkey clone. And again, at my blog, at survivalblog.com, I have uh, instructions posted in one of the articles. If you go through, use the search box and go back through our archives, there's instructions on how to build your own Big Berkey clone using five-gallon plastic buckets. So you're going to buy a set of ceramic filter elements that cost about $60. And the end result, by combining those with a, a drill motor and some basic mechanical skills and some five-gallon plastic buckets, you're going to end up with the equivalent of a $350 big Berkey filter. Very good. So water filtration, food. you know, there's food, food storage. Start out with just the, the staple foods that you use on a regular basis and begin to stock those up. And then you'll want to have comfort foods. You'll want to have lots of bulk foods. And those you can package yourself. You don't have to buy really expensive, commercially packaged, long-term storage food. Again, at my blog, I describe several different methods, one using dry ice and another using uh, commercial off-the-shelf oxygen-absorbing packets and mylar bags, where you can use mylar bags and plastic buckets, 
Uh, and here we're talking food grade plastic buckets. Do not buy used paint buckets or even new paint buckets. You want food grade buckets that will be marked NSF uh, on the bottom. You'll use food grade plastic buckets to create vermin proof and oxygen free or very low oxygen environment for your bulk grain so that you don't open it up years later and find it full of weevils. Little insect eggs don't live in an oxygen free environment, so they never hatch out or if they hatch out, they die immediately. You will need to have your food in those vermin proof buckets. So A, those little critters don't hatch out and B, mice and rats don't chew into the containers of the food and and destroy it. You can pack yourself in those five gallon food grade buckets, wheat, rice, beans, honey, sugar, all the, the, and pasta, for example, all the bulk foods that you would, you would ever need at very low cost per calorie compared to buying packaged foods. So instructions are at my blog. It's survivalblog.com. So uh, water is top of your list, then food. And then for nuclear fallout situations, every family needs to have a dosimeter, a rate meter, and a charger for your dosimeter and rate meter. The dosimeter and rate meter are a little device that look like a fat barreled pen or mechanical pencil. And it's kind of hard to describe, but it uses a little piece of quartz that's ionized and you charge that device with a little charging stand that just uses a battery and a little adjustment meter to zero those that rate meter and that dosimeter. The dosimeter measures the total dose that you received. The rate meter gauges the amount that you receive per hour, which is the critical calculation to determine what dose you're going to receive over the period of days, weeks, and months. So you'll know if you're studying the dosimeter and the rate meter and keeping a, a keeping track in a in a table in a tabular fashion you'll be able to even determine your own emergence time to keep your total dose less than uh, 250 rads. Yeah, and one of the other the other things that are, is really easy to get, a, a little bit expensive, but in the grand scheme of things, not really. You can buy them on Amazon, uh, but they're Faraday bags, which are basically right. bags that are EMP-proof, if you will. And so you would want to put your electronics in there or batteries in there seal that up and and have that in your your closet as well so that you'll actually have electronics let's just say like a pair of walkie-talkies you know that would actually work a radio protector anything that has microcircuits and uh, batteries themselves and even solar panels themselves are fairly immune from EMP but the charge controllers for your photovoltaics all the microcircuits in your radios computers any any like elect- modern electronic device can get fried by EMP. But normally, unless you're right near the blast radius, if a, if a device is disconnected from a power cord and disconnected from an antenna, it will be fairly invulnerable to EMP. But if you have it both disconnected and inside of a Far- Faraday bag or a Faraday can, and that could be as something as simple as a standard galvanized trash can with a tight fitting lid. It's all you need. And then uh, you just need to insulate that item uh, in any kind of plastic so that it is not in electrical contact with the the can itself. So uh, it would be, it's a very simple Faraday protection for any of your electronic items. All of your spare radios and your spare laptop, your older cell phones should all be stored in Faraday protective containers. And again, at survivalblog.com, I describe several different methods for constructing those yourself. It could be as simple as successive layers of saran wrap or plastic bags and aluminum foil. You don't need to buy a a commercial Faraday bag, but uh, if you're going to be taking an item in and out regularly, you really probably should get a commercially made Faraday bag because they're designed to be opened and reclosed numerous times yet still maintain a good seal. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things that I'd recommend as well that's really easy to do, and frankly, everybody should be doing this now no matter what, <laughs> whether they're preparing for a war of some kind or just you know, basically good record keeping, is back up all of your docs, you know, pictures of your driver's license, your birth certificate, 
and then all of your family photos, whatever it may be, onto a secure USB stick. Uh, you know, Iron Key is a great example of one of those. Uh, yep. It's a hardened USB. You you put a password protection on it. All of your data is encrypted. Can't be hacked. But if your computer gets fried, you know, for the vast majority of us these days, our lives are digitally on our hard drive and on Facebook or whatever it may be. Right. Uh, they really have it on a memory stick. In fact, preferably two or three redundant sticks. And one of those is going to go in your bug out bag wrapped up in aluminum foil. Another will go in the, in the Faraday container in your home. And then a, a third copy would go with a relative in a rural area, which would be your presumable bug out location. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just an easy, easy hundred dollar insurance policy there for a lot of really valuable, valuable pieces of information. You know, one of the other last things that I'd recommend here, James, and you, I love your insight on this, is putting together a basic, you know, one to two page document or plan of action, if you will, for your family members and relatives so that if something were to happen like this, which would knock out communication, cell phone would be gone, internet would be gone, you'd have no idea what your other family members were doing. Are you going to their house? Are they going to yours? Are you guys going somewhere else? And all of that is off the table if you haven't put together a basic letter of understanding uh, beforehand. Yes, you really need to have a, a, a family plan and an extended fa family plan. And your family plan is, is really simple, especially for any kids who are enrolled in public school or in private schools where they're not being educated at home. And there's the chance that we could get into a, a shooting war uh, while they're off at school. You need to have pre-designated rally points, bug out locations, and contingency plans so we'll know where to go, whether a, a child needs to wait at school to be picked up or whether they need to beat feet home on foot or by bicycle or um, to a relative's home that might be closer. And where you plan to, to rally, where you plan to shelter, and what your uh, contingency plan is in case this, the town or city that you live in becomes unlivable, what relative or friend you plan to go shelter with, wh what that location is, all their contact information, and then, of course, to go with that, you need to stock that bug out location because you may just have one trip out of town. And in, and in worst case, it may be either on foot or by bicycle. If there's severe EMP, uh, it could even affect the electronic ignition systems of cars. But I do th I have to give the caveat that the EMP effect on vehicles is a little bit over exaggerated in, in the mass media. And if you have EMP that's strong enough to stop your electronic ignition from working on your car, unless you happen to have your car plugged in for charging, if it's a, a hybrid car or perhaps have your, uh, your car on a trickle charger, then odds are, unless you're right in the blast zone itself, your car is probably still going to start. So EMP for, for vehicle ignitions is a little bit overrated. And in fact, if anything, the real risk of EMP is, is going to be to your, your home electronics, anything that's connected to a phone line or to a power line or an Ethernet cable, those are the systems that are at risk because all of those cables constitute an EMP, a antenna for gathering EMP. If you have a standalone device like a smartphone, if it's not plugged into a charger, it's probably going to survive. If you have a vehicle, unless it's you know, plugged in for, for charging or for, to a diagnostic piece of equipment or something, it's probably going to survive and still start. Yeah, I think uh, you know the bigger risk would actually be the fact that most gas stations would be down. <laughs> so you I, might have a car, but whatever's in the tank is pretty much all you're going to get because if a station IPA is up and running, it's going to have a line, you know, eight hours long uh, right. until it runs out of gas, and and most likely their payment methods and pumps are not going to actually work. Again, at, at survivalblog.com, we've published a couple of different plans for creating a fuel pump that can draw fuel to a height of, say, six or eight feet, which is high enough to get uh, fuel out of underground fuel tanks. 
And that fuel pump is powered by a 12 volt DC pump. Typically what you're gonna use is a spare electric fuel pump for your particular brand of vehicle. So that pump serves two different purposes. One, it's a spare fuel pump for your, for your car in case your fuel pump ever fails. And two, configured the way it is with hoses and a 10 foot long 12 volt DC power cord and a cigarette lighter plug, you can use that pump to draw water or draw fuel from underground fuel pump tanks that would otherwise be unreachable if the power grid itself is down. It's a very handy thing to have, and that's probably one of the most important things that people need to fabricate in advance to be ready for a grid down situation. Very good. Well, James, I don't want to. I don't want to run us over your time limit here. We're uh, we're up at the top of our hour, and I just wanted to, to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to join us and to help bring awareness about some you know very basic in my in my mind uh, preparedness items that a, a, a normal, rational, responsible human being should make and, and that needs to make. And uh, thank Absolutely. you again for for making all of your information and resources available for free over at survivalblog.com. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mike, and I pray the 91st Psalm for you and all your listeners. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate your time today. Hope you enjoyed this amazing episode, and uh, go check out James's work, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.